Good evening. As a preliminary matter, this is a public meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals on the comprehensive permit for the village at Cricket Lane, and I, Howard Tracer, am the chairman. For this particular hearing, alternate member Mario Carnavelli will be seated in place of Elaine Baker, who has recused herself. Please permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Eric Spahn. Can you hear me, Eric? He's muted. Okay. Just muted. Okay. My, yes, I'm here. I just muted myself a second ago. So okay, I'm here. That's him. Mario Carnavelli. Oh, yes, sir. yes. Okay. Uh, Sue Noyce, uh, ZBA administrator. Present. And Adam Costa, town council. Present, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Good evening. Today is Thursday, August 30th, 2020, and it is 7.30 p.m., and this is an open meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals, which is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. Due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. For this meeting, the ZBA is convening by telephone conference, video conference via Zoom as posted on the agenda of the Zoning Board of Appeals section of the town's website, identifying how the public may join. You may join us by going to https zoom.us and enter meeting ID 885-6296-0619 and passcode 707600 or by calling 929 2056099, entering meeting ID 885-6296-0619, and if prompted, enter password 707600. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that attendees, attendees are participating by video and or telephone conference. Application information has been provided to the ZBA members. Materials will be presented during the meeting. Permit me to cover some ground rules for the effective clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I, Howard Tracer Chairman or Eric Svarn, Alternate Chairman, will convey the agenda item and or introduce the applicant. As an attendee, we ask that you participate, keeping in mind the following. Please remember to mute your phone uh, or computer when you are not speaking. Please use earbuds, earphones with tablet cell phones to eliminate background noise. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Please be aware that video participants can see you and that you should take care not to screen share your computer when not presenting. Anything that appears on the participant screen will broadcast and be captured by the recording. The chairman will yield the floor, uh, the applicant or their representative and allow them to present their application. If the applicant and or the representative wish to share their screen, please indicate as such so that you can give them permission to do so. At the completion of the presentation by the applicant, the chairman will turn to ZBA members for input, comments, et cetera. ZBA members may at any time seek input and assistance from town council. After the chairman has afforded the ZBA an opportunity to speak or to ask questions, the chairman will then afford the public comment as follows. 
I will seek questions through the raised hand function. For video conference participants, this function can be accessed by clicking the participants option listed in the menu below the photo gallery. Uh, cover your cursor in this area if you don't see it. Window will open and display you on the right. On the bottom of this participant area, you will see a list of phone video participants. And on the bottom, you will see the ability to click or on a button to raise hand. Please ensure your name is displayed. Uh, list your name, address, and then your question. Telephone participants can use their phone keypad while in the Zoom meeting to raise hand by hitting star nine. I will seek to call upon questions from the public that have hit the raised hand button and order in the order for which they are listed. Please identify your name and address, then your question or comment. Your hand will be lowered when you have given the floor for your question. We will continue down the list of those in the raised hand column. If you are unable to locate the raised hand, please physically raise your hand and we will turn to you after we have taken those seeking the floor through the raise hand function. Should there be a physical or electronic submittal of questions or concerns that were received by our office, they will be referenced and added to the record. Generally speaking, we anticipate the applicant to present, taking preliminary CBA comments, allotting time for public comment, and establishing a timeline for proceeding and the anticipated topics expected to be reviewed or discussed within that timeline. We're expecting this evening's meeting to last approximately 90 to 120 minutes. Okay, Eric, uh, can you read the agenda, please? Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to add that Joe Sirwaka has also joined us, our peer reviewer. Okay, thank you. Okay. Agenda, agenda, public hearings. Cricket Lane, LLC, 55R Pearson Drive. The applicant is requesting a comprehensive permit under general law, chapter 40B, sections 20-23 to construct village at Cricket Lane for 24 single family detached home ownership units on accessors map R20-0-75. Okay, so okay. is the applicant present? Yes, sir. Okay, hello, good evening. Give me a minute, there we go. Good evening. Okay, yeah. tell us about your project. Well, uh, Who Mr. else, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Deshane, should we also... Uh... Excuse me? Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I, that broke Eric, up. But, uh, yes, um, with me, uh, Mr. Osgood and Mr. Erickson are also um, on the line, if you could unmute them as well. Good evening. Okay, I th think we're good. Good evening. Good evening. All right, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'll start. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, good evening. Um, my name is Douglas DeShane. I'm an attorney representing Cricket Lane Development, LLC, the applicant uh, for this comprehensive permit. Uh, with me this evening, Walter Erickson, who is the manager of Cricket Lane Development, as well as Ben Osgood, our engineer from Ranger Engineering Group. We thank the board for the opportunity to present our project. Um, as was mentioned, the villages at Cricket Lane is being proposed at 55R Pearson Drive. Um, the site is currently owned by Byfield Estates LLC and is under contract for sale to Mr. Erickson, which is how he um, satisfied site control purposes for site of his project eligibility. Um, the project is, as said, proposed pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 40B. Uh, Mass Housing is acting as the project administrator, and it was Mass Housing that issued the site eligibility letter 
allowing our application to move forward uh, with this board. The site contains 15.08 acres of property, of which 5.31 acres is classified as wetland resource areas. Um, we are proposing a development area of just under four acres at 3.91 acres, the development area. It contains no wetlands. Uh, we are proposing an op open space within the project of 6.35 acres, of which 1.9 acres is wetlands. And lastly, we are proposing and, and working with the um, Mass Fisheries and Wildlife, we are proposing to donate a, a parcel of 4.8 acres to Fisheries and Wildlife, of which 3.4 acres of it is wetland. So overall, as I said, 15.08 acres, 5.3 acres of wetland. Um, our proposed open space constitutes just over 74% of the total project site. The proposal is to build 24 single family detached home ownership units. Um, as this is a 40B project, we are required to provide 25% or six of those units as affordable. And we are in fact proposing six affordable units uh, as well as 18 market rate units. Within those affordable, six affordable units, we are proposing to have five three bedroom units and a single four bedroom unit. With respect to the 18 market rate units, uh, we are proposing to have 12 three bedroom units and six uh, four bedroom units. Um, and if I could, sir, um, Mr. Osgood, would it be possible for you to uh, share the site plan so that as I'm speaking, people can see the layout and, and the proposed units? Yes, just need to give me, sorry. No, Susan needs to give me permission, I believe. I just did. Thank you. So here's the colored site plan. We have, Doug, I'll just show you, we have the existing conditions, the colored site plan. Here's the layout and materials with grading and drainage and utilities. So just the colored site plan at this point, Ben, please. Thank okay. you very much. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, 24 units, uh, six affordable, 18 market rate units. Um, the affordable units will be made affordable to families whose income is at or below 80% of the median family income for the region. Uh, currently, uh, that, that um, income level for a family of four is $89,200. So they would have to make uh, that or below to qualify for the purchase of the affordable units. Uh, and that would be for a family of four. Um, it's lower uh, for a family of three and, and higher for more than a family of four. The affordable units will remain affordable through deed restrictions in perpetuity uh, so that they will always remain affordable. As such, these units will count towards the town's affordable housing inventory uh, in its goal to reach 10% of its housing stock as affordable. Um, the units themselves are all two-story units um, with porches and two-car garages. And we have provided extensive uh, plans and, and, and floor plans and elevation plans of the units themselves within our application. Um, they are all, uh, as I said, two stories with two-car garages and front porches. Uh, they will be constructed using typical New England style materials, including hardy plank or some similar clapboard siding, architectural roof shingles, double hung high energy efficient windows. Uh, Mr. Erickson is proposing to build these homes as highly energy efficient and is expecting his HERS ratings on these structures to be at 45 or less, which is a very uh, high energy efficiency. Uh, he will be using uh, energy efficient appliances, heating systems, and hot water systems. Um, they will um, 
all have solar panels. Each of the homes will also have solar panels. So we are looking to make these homes as uh, energy efficient as possible. Uh, within the project, we are also proposing to provide some passive recreational opportunities for our homeowners. Uh, there is a proposal for a small playing field, soccer field, or it's a playing field of whatever type, um, as well as benches and a swing set for the residents within the recreational areas. And we are also proposing to provide a trail that would connect the main road of the project to the um, Martin Burns Reservation. And Mr. Osgood is showing where that, um, where that trail would be. With respect to site utilities, uh, the project will uh, uh, utilize municipal water. There will be a shared septic system, subsurface sewage disposal system. The, there is electric telephone and cable existing on, on Pearson Drive, and we will be extending those utilities into the project. Uh, the site, as you will hear shortly from Mr. Osgood, has been engineered to meet state stormwater management regulations. With respect to parking for the units, we are proposing parking for 102 cars. That will be made up of two parking spaces within the garages, as well as two outdoor spaces for each unit. So there will be four dedicated spaces per unit, which I believe exceeds the town's uh, parking requirements. Uh, additionally, we're providing six visitor parking spaces adjacent to the recreation area, and they are shown along the main access road adjacent to the uh, recreational area. Um, the, all of the buildings proposed will comply with all state building codes and all state environmental codes. We have recently filed um, with the Board of Health uh, for the su subsurface sewage disposal system, and we will be filing shortly uh, with the Conservation Commission uh, with respect to the uh, wetlands uh, impacts. So that should be filed soon, if not next week. But we will meet uh, state environmental codes. Um, we have provided a traffic assessment report uh, detailing the expected traffic impacts of the project. Um, that report has been reviewed by the town's peer review engineers uh, who have provided a a, a, a peer review comment on the, um, on the traffic study, but uh, have generally concluded that the project will not create uh, traffic, uh, significant traffic or safety impacts. Um, the stormwater has also been, uh, stormwater report has been provided and has uh, been under review by uh, the town's consultant. Uh, who I understand is on the meeting tonight, and as is Mr. Osgood, so they can uh, comment as to that. Um, we have also re received a significant number of comments from the various town departments, boards, and commissions, which we have um, taken into consideration and integrated into uh, considered changes to the initial project. Uh, and we have also provided written responses to, I believe, most, if not all, of those comments. Um, we have also had the project reviewed, uh, one of those departments was your water district, which has verified that there is in fact satisfactory water supply uh, existing for the project. Um, Mr. Chairman, I know that was sort of a brief overview, but uh, given the comprehensive nature of our application and the information that has been provided, I didn't, uh, I assume you didn't want me to spend an hour or so uh, going through the details, but that was a, a general overview. And with the board's permission, uh, I would ask Mr. Osgood to provide you an overview of the project from an engineering perspective in terms of the, the, the where and whys and the sizes and the lengths and the distances of everything. So with that, if Mr. Osgood could um, provide that um, review, please. Okay. So I'll start out with just a general site overview. This is the parcel of land here, 55 Rear Pearson Drive. The green areas are the wetlands. Um, Pearson Drive is down here at the bottom of the screen. 
So there are three main or three main wetland areas in a small isolated area, but this is wetland series D and E. And up in the top corner here, there's a vernal pool. It's overlaps onto this property with the Martin Burns property. The Martin Burns property is behind here to the northeast and northwest. It surrounds it on two sides. There's a second wetland here, which is the A series wetland. And this actually is an isolated land subject to flooding. It is not connected to anything. Um, so it is not a protectable wetland under the, regu the uh, state's Wetland Protection Act. There's another small area of wetland here. I believe the B series that again is an isolated land subject to flooding um, and is not protectable under the wetland protection regulations. And then the C series wetlands, we delineated this line here and that's a large wetland system associated with this intermittent stream that flows to the south. Um, our development is limited to this upland area which is shaded in gray here and all these little dots, these little black areas are where we have done the uh, soil testing for the septic system and the stormwater systems. Now I have to mention um, this area A, we did do a vernal pool investigation. Mary Rimmer did that for us and submitted it twice to DEP and they've rejected the application that it, that it is a vernal pool. Um, based on the lack of information or the small amount of information submitted uh, or witnessed in the field there. The main concern with DEP was, does it hold water long enough to be a vernal pool? And we again identified that this was dry in the first week of June. Um, so we have not treated it as a vernal pool with this submittal. However, we have respected the limits of that vernal, of, of that isolated wetlands. Um, so moving down, as, as Doug mentioned, we access from Pearson Drive across an existing property here through an easement. We do fill a little bit of wetlands right here. It's a limited crossing. Um, and as he said, we're, we have the application ready to go with the Conservation Commission. There's an 800 foot dead end road that comes in to a cul-de-sac. The road's 22 feet wide, has a five foot sidewalk on the right side, has sloped granite curb on both sides. Uh, the driveways are all 20 feet long to accommodate two cars in the driveways. And there are two common driveways, which also are fire lanes. There's this lane here, which is about uh, 200, 150 to 200 feet long. And then this lane here, which is a little less than 300 feet long. Um, and they meet, <clears throat> excuse me, the NFPA um, regulations for fire lanes. We can have a dead end fire lane up to 300 feet long and 16 feet wide. So these driveways um, comply with that. And they would be marked as fire lanes with no parking within those roadways. Uh, we did provide some parking areas. There's one right here. Uh, there's another here. This one here is for the gazebo, which would be the central mail location. We have a playground area here. And then this is the soccer field, playing field area, which is above the septic system. We have two additional parking areas to provide for overflow parking up in the cul-de-sac. And, and then we have proposed street trees shown in this plan. I should note that these dashed lines are limit of use areas. They are not lot lines. Um, these would just be the areas that were dedicated solely for the use of these each unit. Uh, they would be individually maintained, although there would be a homeowners association, but this is where each unit would have the ability to do what they wanted with their yard. Uh, um, they're not individual lots. These house footprints that we've shown here, as Doug mentioned, there are three or four different um, styles of home. 
these footprints are the largest footprint that could be built. So there are some that are smaller than this. There are one style is a little bit narrower, same length. The other is same width, you know, but not as deep. So this is the maximum footprint that could be built um, depending upon which plan is, is chosen for each lot. I'll just I'll scroll down to the next page. So this gets into, this is the grading and drainage plan. And um, I'll just review real quick. We, we have a um, catch basin and pipe system that captures the water from the roadway. We have roof drains that capture water from the roofs. Some of them are piped into the drain system. Some of them are piped into individual infiltration chambers that are located at each house. Uh, I can zoom in a little bit. And for example, here are two chambers here, chamber here, chamber here. So that will take roof water from the units and infiltrate it into the ground. We have two main detention infiltration areas. This here is a buried detention and infiltration area. So we bring water into that from the roadway. We store some of it temporarily and let it out slowly. Some of it is never let out through the outlet pipe, but it drains slowly over time and infiltrates groundwater. That area outlets to a larger detention area, which captures uh, water from the drain system as well as from these units in this area here. Captures the water, holds it, and, in, and uh, outlets it through a pipe with an outlet control structure into the adjacent wetlands. We have another stormwater detention pond here. This captures water from the beginning of the roadway. This has a pocket wetland, which is a constructed wetland to provide treatment. And it has an outlet control structure that provides flow control uh, to meet with the stormwater management flow control regulations. That outlets over in this area here. The last stormwater pond is, is a small pond here which, which captures water that she flows off of the septic system area. Um, there are no impervious surface, surfaces that flow into this area so we don't provide treatment, just some flow control to keep our, our rates of runoff below in the post condition as they, versus the, what's in the precondition. This area over here is our wetland replacement area. We have a little bit of wetland filling associated with the roadway. So we're replacing it over here. And we also have some historic wetlands that are being filled or that, that were filled in the past that we have accommodated with replacing some of them here and then part of them here. Um, so this is the utility plan and this shows the water lines. We have an eight inch water line coming up the roadway. Um, you, 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 you if I could just jump in for a second, could you please identify the sheet by drawing name and then talk is, about it please? Yep, this is sheet four of the plan set. I believe this is, um, this is the utility plan. So this has the eight inch water line coming down the roadway. Um, it shows the sewer manholes, which are a little bit difficult to see. Um, actually, here's a sewer manhole, sewer manhole. So we capture all of the wastewater through a sewer pipe and manhole system. We bring it down to a 18,000 gallon septic tank which is tank one, a 9,000 gallon septic tank two, a 10,000 gallon pump chamber. We pump up into two leach fields, which are located in this area here, and they're Presby leach fields um, to provide 8,900 gallons of um, flow capacity. So there is a limit to the number of bedrooms. That's why, as Doug mentioned, there are a certain number of three bedrooms and a certain number of four bedrooms we can only um, accommodate 8,900 gallons worth of flow. So 
um, will it keep the number of bedrooms, you know, to uh, to the number that it can be handled by that 8,900 gallons. Um, and, and again, as Doug said, uh, electric cable and communication lines will come in underground. Um, we do have, I should just mention, we have several street lights. We're proposing a street light at the entrance. Um, one right in here, another one up the street here, and they're solar street lights. There's four of them total. It's just to provide, you know, some, some lighting at night for uh, the residents when they're entering and, you know, leaving the site. Um, we do have a small, we have a retaining wall here to limit the amount of wetlands filling. <clears throat> and, and I think that's about it. I, you know, we do have buffer zone disturbance. As we've said, we, we're going to the Conservation Commission. We're gonna submit next week. Uh, everything is, is all ready to go for that. Um, we feel we meet the regulations. It's a buffer zone project. It's a limited crossing project here for the wetlands. Um, there are some, still some outstanding issues with the stormwater system that Joe Shawaka could comment about. Uh, but I think we have taken care of those with the recent plan revisions that we submitted. We haven't even submitted the hard copies yet, but we have submitted uh, plans that we feel address all of Joe's comments. Um, additional soil testing was done and I, my fault, I neglected to include the soil sheets for the new soil testing in the soil, the drainage report, but he will be receiving those documents uh, by Monday at the latest hard copies. Um, so I think we've addressed everything that Joe has brought up. We haven't heard anything yet from Ann Martin. Um, and I guess she's gonna take a look at these revised plans next week. So I think that's it. Um, have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Eric or uh, Harvey Hill. Sure, I think, um, Ben, if you go back to the colored site plan, please. Has that been submitted to us? And is this, is this a landscape plan or is this just a diagrammatic plan? This is just a diagrammatic, it's a presentation plan. Um, I believe it has been submitted but uh, I will make sure if it hasn't that that I send it along tomorrow electronically and uh, we can include I, I can include 11 by 17 color copies of this plan I can't do the 24 by 36 but I can include 11 by 17 color copies is there a landscape plan in, in process a design we, plan we don't have an individual unit landscaping plan um, we've shown the street trees and there is a, I guess, a landscape plan that shows that, that shows snow storage and street trees. We do not have an individual unit landscape plan. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, if I could just introduce myself, give you a little bit of the background. My name is Walter Erickson. Okay. And I'm the manager of Cricket Road Development, LLC. I have been in the construction industry for over 35 years and built approximately a thousand units. This will be my fifth 40B project uh, that I've done through mass housing as a home ownership development. We're currently finishing up 28 units in Westford, Mass. Uh, we should be completely done the project in another month and a half. Uh, so this will be my fifth project. We've had a lot of experience in 40B developments and a lot of experience in this size development and larger. And uh, we look forward to working with them. Okay, thank you. Okay, Eric, any other questions at this time? I know, thank you. Okay, uh, Mario, do you have any comments? Um, yeah, just a, just a few. Uh, you guys had mentioned that uh, uh, the Byfield Water Department did say that uh, there was adequate uh, water supply. Um, however, in reading some of the documents uh, from the Mass Water Resource Commission, 
it lists the uh, Parker River is considered one of the most highly stressed rivers in the Commonwealth. And um, there was a thought that maybe they should do some more investigating on whether or not the uh, water supply was adequate or not. Mr. Chairman, if I could answer. Yeah, please do. Well, um, we have uh, reviewed that information, sir. Um, however, it, it, it is incumbent on us to um, work with your water department and water district to make to determine whether or not um, there is adequate water available for the project. And as was stated, um, your water department feels that currently their system has adequate water to provide to us. So um, it, it, it appears that, um, you know, our additional water would not be a, have a direct impact as the town has already, in essence, has access to that water to begin with. So this would not require the town to, um, at least according to your water department, you know, seek additional water sources, but that, that they currently have it. Okay. In, in addition, Mr. Chairman? Yes, if, if I could. In addition to that, we will we'll be using water conservation, water saving devices in the individual homes, low flush toilets, energy efficient shower heads, and for the irrigation system on a project of this size, we typically drill a separate artesian well that we provide irrigation with uh, well water so that we don't use valuable town water. Okay. Uh, one other question uh, regarding the vernal pool, do you say uh, one does exist? Yes, in the, uh, this has been, um, in the north corner here, it overlaps onto the Martin Burns Reservation. Uh, it is here and it has been certified as a vernal pool. This is the line right here. It's inside the wetland line. That's the limit of the vernal pool that was flagged by Pat Huckery from Fish and Wildlife. Okay. And, um, you know, one of the comments from the Parker River um, Clean Water Association talked about the ratio of um, the, the wetlands. You mentioned a one-to-one -one in your project and they recommend a, a, at least a three to five um, we, ratio. We, are, we are providing a 1.5 to one replacement ratio. Um, I believe the requirement is only 1.1 and you strive for 1.5. Okay, just just curious so that they said the impact would be, you know, the mitigation would be uh, extensive. They're concerned, and also it just talks about um, the concern on the mass housing was was concerned about the same issue, and that's from um, the Parker River Clean Water Association. Right. So we're providing, as I said, one point five. Uh, but that includes historic filling that has nothing to do with this project. It was done as near as we can tell back in the late eighties, early nineties. And that was on in this area right here, this shade of blue area. Um, so we're replacing that at a 1.5 ratio as well. So um, not only are we compensating for the small amount that we're filling here, we're taking care of this area that was filled previously. Okay. Um, the other th issue was the fire department. I know you guys had said that uh, it meets the standards. However, you know, and just in reading some of the documents that the uh, chief had mentioned, uh, you know, getting emergency vehicles, l larger vehicles would in reverse direction on two proposed dead end streets would, you know, probably encroach on the adjacent properties or the vehicles would have to actually back down the streets. Right, they would, have, they would have to back down the streets, um, but it does meet the requirements of the NFPA. Um, and then, and I know, I think I heard Walter trying, he was gonna speak. Um, I believe, Walter, correct me if I'm wrong, you're gonna have residential sprinkler systems in these units. That's correct. Although we haven't had a chance to meet with the fire department yet, we've contacted them a few times and we will be meeting with them, but in order to, uh, provide some additional fire protection. We're gonna put individual 
residential sprinkler systems in every home. Okay. And, and the other concern from the fire department was, uh, you know, the 15 feet versus 20. And, and I did read your information that had the fireproofing that only needs uh, 15 uh, feet uh, distance. However, I think the concern was uh, getting a fire equipment in the rear of the buildings or the homes because there's no other access except in between the homes. Right. The building code allows the homes to be as close as five feet. With without any entrance. without any rear entrance? Correct. Rear access? Correct. Okay. Mr. And, and Chairman, if I could, I'd like to reiterate the fact that, um, you know, we are, we are cognizant of the, 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 the fire department uh, comments and we, we have in fact reached out to the chief um, a number of times seeking a meeting to sit down and, and work through some of these issues and um, we have been unsuccessful to date in, in receiving a response to allow for that meeting, but we will continue to press forth and uh, we will be sitting down with the fire chief if he'll grant us the time um, to talk about some of those things and to um, see if some of those can be addressed. Um, so again, we are looking to uh, work with your fire department uh, to address their comments and we'll right. do so as soon as um, they're ready. All right, thank you for making us aware of that. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Chairman, this is Susan. Right, I so did hear from the fire department today. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can you hear? Okay. Um, and they did acknowledge, they did acknowledge that the applicant has attempted to reach out to them a couple of times. They did get back to them and say they would prefer to meet um, more in a group, including some other people. Um, at this juncture, it may just make sense to invite the fire chief to our next meeting. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. That's it for me, Howard. Okay, thank you, Mario. Um, I don't know if this is a good time or not, but Mr. Swarker, uh, would you like to make any comments on what's been presented at, at this time or would you prefer to wait? Uh, no, I'd be happy to make a few comments. Can everyone hear me all right? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, as Ben mentioned, I'm, I'm just waiting for a few outstanding issues to be addressed, uh, most, mostly relative to soil tests that were conducted on the site. And he mentioned that that would be avail available to me on Monday. So um, just a few outstanding items, but uh, we've done two reviews and most of the issues have been addressed relative to stormwater. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Susan, uh, do we have any uh, public comment uh, waiting to speak? Um, if uh, Ben could uh, stop sharing. So um, I see that Mr. Erickson has his hand up. Are you all set now, Walter? I'm all set now. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I see someone named Eric Guest. I'm going to unmute. Um, if you could state who you are. Sure. My name is Eric Eidreiner. I'm at 2 Pearson Drive. Um, so I'm, it was stated in the developer's presentation that a traffic study found that the development would not create significant traffic or safety impacts. Um, and I walk a lot around the neighborhood and I see people actually who live on neighboring streets coming to Pearson Drive because it's a nice, you know, pleasant area. And it sounds to me like, you know, traffic would increase approximately 30 to 40 percent um, if we're talking about adding 24 homes to a neighborhood of 60 to 70. So I'm curious how it can be said that, that, that there wouldn't be a significant traffic impact. Okay, this is the chairman, Eric. Uh, I'm gonna let somebody answer that, but we, we're we gonna uh, try to address traffic and environmental issues at another meeting. But I'm gonna let someone answer your question and 
will it, it's more uh, directed towards the, the plan in general and in uh, stormwater civil engineering aspects tonight. But understand. Well, yeah. Question: If we have more, and we'll get a response for you. Okay. So, do you have anything else, or you're you're looking for a comment at this point? Sorry, can we hear you? Okay, ben, uh, can, can that you was all. Right. Right. Um, thank you. There we go. Okay, Mr. Little, Chairman, or whoever, Doug. Yes, you can speak, Doug. Yeah, we're frozen. Yeah, it looks like he froze on his end. Um, Eric, did, I'm did you sorry. have a question? That's no. right. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Deshaines. Um, I was just going to say with respect to the last gentleman's question, uh, I believe that the um, peer review that was done by Stantec um, is available at Town Hall and it, and it would give him some excellent insight as to um, the study that was done and how the peer reviewer um, then analyzes that information to reach their conclusions. He, his question was how, you know, how was that conclusion reached? And uh, while we'll be happy to present it to him, um, he may find that document very um, educational. Okay. Um, does that answer your uh, question, Eric? Sure, and no, I, I appreciate that perspective. I, I would say from a comment perspective that still the 30 to 40 percent feels significant, but I understand. I'll take a look at that. Thank take you. Take a look at it, and this is just the first of many, many meetings, so come back again. Okay, Susan, do we have anybody else with a raised hand? Um, Mr. Linden, just a moment. Thanks, Susan. Uh, yeah, so regarding the, the traffic comment, um, just quickly, from what I understood, the peer reviewer found that there wasn't enough traffic to warrant a full-on study. So some data was collected and traffic patterns were assessed, but a full-blown traffic study was not warranted because the traffic is not high enough. But to Eric's point, Yes, traffic's going to increase and it's going to impact residents, particularly when you put a development at the end of a cul-de-sac. So I understand that we will discuss this another, another time, um, but the information on what was done for traffic does not change Eric's point. So I just wanna make that point. And then I wanna ask about regarding water it seems that the report suggested there was enough water for uh, fire hydrants. It did not say anything about residential use. So what is the water draw of 24 houses going to do, not only to the water in the district, which has been overdrawing for you know 10 years now, um, but what is it going to do to the rest of the residents in Pearson Drive who constantly complain about water pressure problems at certain times of the year? I mean. It's not surprising on the North Shore that different communities are having restrictions because of, of water availability. So that's the, just another comment I wanted to make about how, you know, if we're going to define things in terms of significant or meeting certain metrics, there are impacts that are going to occur when you increase a community by 30%. So these are considerations that need to, to come into play. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have another hand by a uh, Bart Bracken. Hi, uh, thank you for having this could, uh, hearing. There we go. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yes, yep. we're right ahead. Okay, sorry, um, thank you for this. Uh, thank you for the hearing and I appreciate the presentation. I found the presentation a bit clinical and uh, not really dealing with, I think, the major concern, uh, concerns uh, that we as residents have had. 
Um, yes, you talked about the specific, uh, you know, details of what the housing is and what the law is. We raised a number of questions. Um, I think there's a number of letters that were sent back. And this is my question really to more of um, our representatives here, uh, the zoning uh, board uh, members, is that we um, identified numerous misrepresentations on the 40B application. Um, we've identified a number of areas of concern. I'm, I'm frankly a bit um, amazed that the issue with the fire department has not been addressed. I know they said that the fire department did not get back to them. But that's been out there for months. Um, so what is the um, zoning board doing in terms of proceeding with this? Have they assumed that the 40B application is appropriate and, and the letter of um, approval is um, not is impeachable and uh, therefore we are not able to do anything about it uh, because I, I, I frankly am amazed that we still are sitting here discussing a cul-de-sac at the end of a cul-de-sac with numerous environmental water traffic issues and concerns when there are other places that's better to build this um, 40B of which I totally support. I totally support 40B, but this just absolutely makes no sense. And I just want to know what the um, zoning board is doing to address the numerous concerns that have been raised numerous times. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll speak for myself and the board, I believe that this is just the beginning tonight. Uh, we're allowing the applicant to present in a public hearing and we do have a record of all the concerns uh, from letters from the public, from the departments, uh, the different boards, and they're all going to be taken uh, seriously. But uh, we have to start tonight by allowing the applicant to uh, make their presentation to the public and then we will address what we think needs to be addressed as the meetings go on. This is not going to be just one night. This is just an introduction really tonight. So does that answer your concerns? I'm not talking about specific uh, things that you asked, but as far as how this is going to be handled. Eric, do you want to add anything to that? I think you said it clearly, Howard. It's, it's uh, the first step. And, and I think the gentleman raised some valid questions as to uh, concerns of the application and concerns of the letter of approval. Um, we do have a fair amount of information here that needs to be, it needs to be discussed in a logical way so that, um, so that we can build on the comments. So I do think how is part of um, the understanding, maybe there is some um, direction or outlay that, that needs to be done to, um, to lay out the discussion before us. And I, I don't know if we, we have that, you know, tonight we have some consultants, we're staggering other consultants. So not all questions can be, uh, that are asked can be addressed because we have certain um, third party reviewers that that we're not having all on the same night because we, we would never get through it all. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead. Dan. Um, Doug just texted me. He lost his connection. Okay. Think, uh, he's going to try to get back on, but I think it's important that he be on the call. Yes, I agree. Mr. Chairman. In the meantime, did you want to take another question from Mr. Linden? Uh, what uh, Adam Coster, our town council, would like to speak. So, uh, can you put him on? I, I'm I'm on. I think I, I have uh, I'm I'm unmuted. So um, so thank you, Susan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So I just thought that if you'd indulge me for a moment, uh, particularly where Attorney Deshane is not on. Uh, on the meeting at the moment, and I think he'd, he'd trust me to sort of give it to you straight, <laughs> uh, even in his absence. Uh, but I, th I think it may be beneficial, not, not so much for board members, because I know I've had 
occasion in the past to talk to board members about the 40B process. And I know that you as a zoning board are familiar with what the process entails, but members of the public, although there has been a prior application for this site, um, may not be all that aware about um, how the process works and how, frankly, it differs from more traditional permitting processes that exist in municipalities. Um, many, member, many members of the community and many applicants are familiar with and aware of traditional special permits or variances, orders of conditions, and how those processes work. And um, the good news from a municipal perspective with respect to those other types of permits is that generally the municipality has a great degree of discretion. Uh, zoning boards can deny special permits and the substantial majority of the time, those denials they are challenged in a courtroom or elsewhere are upheld. Same thing with respect to decisions with regard to variances or site plan approvals or denials, orders of conditions. The Chapter 40B permit, also known as the comprehensive permit, is a bit different. And it's different for a couple of reasons. One, the permitting process itself is different. It is exactly what it sounds like. It's a comprehensive permit, meaning that your board, lucky you, have the authority of many other local boards. You stand in the shoes of the conservation commission applying the local wetlands bylaw. You stand in the shoes of the Board of Health applying any local Board of Health rules and regulations. You act as special permit granting authority, essentially. You act as site plan review authority, essentially. You have all of that various authority and you're required to exercise it as part of a single process, this, this process that's now underway. Additionally, in the event that you act too quickly or you act without complete review of the application before you to simply deny it, and I appreciate that there are contentious projects, there are projects that um, may not sit well with neighbors and other residents, and the question might be asked, why don't you just deny this uh, out, of, out of turn immediately without wasting time and effort in reviewing the project? Well, the answer I would give you is, unlike those other special permits and variances that I referenced a moment ago, if you deny a comprehensive permit, it doesn't go straight to court and you're not entitled to that same deference that you're entitled to with the other permits. It goes first to an administrative agency, the Housing Appeals Committee, and rather than you being entitled to deference, the law, the law that seeks to create affordable housing, this, this chapter 40B law, the law is entitled to deference. And it's an uphill battle for the town to support a straight up denial of a comprehensive permit. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying it's a foregone conclusion that this project is approved. I'm not saying anything of that, of that sort. I'm just saying that it is a, a complex and comprehensive process. The regulations uh, give you up to 180 days to complete that process. Um, and so there's a reason for that. And the reason is because there are multiple reviews required to be performed by this board. It's expected that you will bring in different peer review consultants to provide you with the expertise that you need to answer a butter's concerns, residents' concerns, legal concerns, practical concerns. So I guess in some ways I'm echoing what the board members have already said that this is the first of what will be several meetings, how many we don't know. And certainly my recommendation to the board will be that we structure future meetings to be on topic, that we have a meeting that is dedicated um, substantially or at least in, in, in substantial part to the topic of traffic, that we have a meeting that is dedicated substantially to any concerns that might relate to Conservation Commission jurisdiction or or stormwater, um, that we address things like landscaping, uh, of utilities, that you bring in the various department heads that you, you might need to, whether it be police or uh, water, to get the answers to the questions that the board has and the questions that the public has. Those things will happen, but I, I would agree with the assessment of the presentation as sort of clinical tonight. I think that, that was the term that was used, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing uh, Attorney DeShane. I think that initial presentations are generally clinical. They give the bare bones, uh, a bare bones description of what's before you with, this, with the expectation that there is much more to come. Okay, thank you. Um, does that answer your questions clearly? 
about the process? Uh, I forgot who asked the question, so. Um, I think it was probably a combination between Bart and uh, Mr. Linden. So um, I think, you know, they've all heard what Adam and yourself have said at this point. Um, I see that Mr. Linden still has a question and then perhaps we can turn it over to back to Mr. DeShane's and see um, what else he had, can add to the conversation. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Mr. Costa. I appreciate um, that insight. And, and I think one of the frustrations for many of us residents is that we have actually gone through this process before, right? So this isn't, you know, this may be a new project in certain names and certain aspects, um, but the application is the same. And all of the concerns that were previously raised have been hashed out. And so I think some of us are frustrated with a day one meeting where not only are we on a time limit, we, we can't, this, these meetings can't go into perpetuity, right? We are on a time limit. limit. Um, and so I guess we are looking for, you know, what is the strategy here for discussing this? Um, so I appreciate the, the suggestion that the meetings have a structure. And I also appreciate that the first meeting is intentionally, you know, an introduction. So um, I, I'll save more comments for, for other meetings, but thanks for commenting on that. Okay. So do we have any other raised hands? And is Mr. Deshaines back with us? Yes, I am, Mr. Chair, and I apologize. I'm a victim of uh, my, our, the internet crashing, I, our, our Wi-Fi crashing. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, no need to apologize. Uh, sir, I, I have nothing to add. I think I, I caught the, the end of Mr. Costa's statements, and, and I, I do apologize if my presentation was clinical, but it is the opening hearing, and we wanted to give you a quick overview fully expecting that we would from here forward schedule specific topics of discussion at the further meeting so that not only can the town be prepared and, and the abutters be prepared to address their concerns on particular topics, but it also allows us to bring our resources so that when we talk about environmental issues, we will have our environmental and wetland scientists with us. When we talk about traffic, we can have our traffic experts as well. So. Um, I do expect to follow along the, the guidelines uh, set forth by Mr. Costa, Attorney Costa. Okay, thank you. Okay, Susan, any other raised hands? Um, Eric is. <laughs> yeah. uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I had, I had my previous comment was just directed to the plans that were presented, but I do have several comments of which I don't expect a direct answer to tonight, but just along some of the lines of some of the um, reading through some of the documentation. Okay, go right ahead. All right, so is there a homeowners association or um, prepared or thought about for the particular development? Are there covenances and rules for the development, such as no boat storage, no trailers and yards, um, are residents allowed to put sheds on their limited exclusive use areas? Um, the documentation re references some uh, agreement with the abutting neighbor next to the ent entrance, which I believe is Mr. Short, in terms of some kind of screening. Uh, is that agreement available to understand? Uh, what other developments exist in Newbury that are similar or the same as, as proposed as Cricket Lane? Uh, the traffic study was done, the traffic assessment was done in October of 2016. Is there a need for an updated traffic assessment or a full study? Is there a list of all requested waivers? Is there a list of ZBA bylaw requested wa waivers? Um, talked about site access. Is the donated land uh, to Mass Wildlife, is that identified on a certain drawing as, as documented by a boundary line? 
things like the solar panels are not shown on the roof plans. It would be interesting to see if they were shown and, and how they're positioned to understand their um, effectiveness. Is there a planting plan that shows the full extent of intended planting? Um, I'd like to see more information about the sprinklers and how they get laid out and against the budding houses where you would have a cold garage in a heated tempered space and what kind of system that might be. And then I'd appreciate if in future discussions that any drawing that is presented, the actual drawing number and date or data revision be provided so everybody understands what we're, what we're looking at. Uh, the, the drawings in our hand are dated 6 26, 20. I noticed some of the other drawings had that were shown tonight had additional revisions in the title block. So I'd just like to make sure we understand exactly what drawing is being referenced. That's the short list for now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mario, do you have anything to add at this time? No, I think uh, Eric did a pretty good job on that. Thanks. Okay. All right. So, um, if I could ask, um, Mr. Costa, could you address the time frame as it relates to the application filing and the current legislation? So, uh, so I'd be happy to, um, with your permission, Mr. Chairman. Go right ahead. So I mentioned before that under uh, 760 CMR 56, which is a section of the Code of Massachusetts Regulations that governs 40B developments and the Chapter 40B comprehensive permit process locally, there is a 180 day time frame that is contemplated. And that time frame runs from the date of opening the public hearing until the date of closing the public hearing. And then there's a 40 day period after the close of the public hearing during which time the board is expected to render a decision and file that decision with the town clerk's office. Um, I will tell you, and I think you've had this experience before, maybe even with the, the previous project proposed for the site, that sometimes the review process lasts, even in the absence of, uh, of a worldwide pandemic, um, lasts more than the 180 days, simply because there is so much to accomplish uh, during the course of that process. So my experience with uh, most applicants, and I have experience um, representing municipalities, both in dealing with Attorney DeShane and in dealing with Mr. Erickson, um, that applicants, including both of them, have been quite cooperative in providing the necessary time for a board to fully review, fully vet, uh, and get comfortable with the development, whether that results in an approval or a denial, putting the board in a position where it's prepared to render a decision. Um, with that said, we also now have the benefit of the governor's orders, and we have the benefit of Chapter 53 of the Acts of 2020, which was special legislation adopted back in May, uh, May or early June, um, that uh, acknowledged uh, the presence of COVID-19 and the state of emergency in Massachusetts and told certain time frames. Um, it's a bit unclear of the nature of what has transpired in recent months, early in the pandemic, most municipal boards are not meeting. So the legislation uh, provides flexibility to not convene public hearings. It told certain hearing deadlines uh, that might have already been underway as of the declaration of a state of emergency in early March. But in a circumstance like this, where the public hearing has gotten underway, uh, got underway after the, the state of emergency was declared, but Newbury, like most communities, are now conducting these virtual meetings through Zoom and similar platforms. It's a bit unclear what that does to the full 180-day time frame. Um, again, I don't think it will be problematic regardless. I think we have the benefit of, number one, even though the public hearing was open prior to tonight, tonight is the first substantive session of the public hearing, and I think we all acknowledge that. Um, and second of all, I, I think that um, applicants um, in other contexts outside of 40B have been cooperative with municipalities over the past few months, recognizing just the reality that we are in uncharted territory. And I find it very hard to believe that any judge is going to be sympathetic to an overzealous applicant or an overzealous municipality uh, who's trying to use COVID-19 and the delays to their advantage. Certainly one thing that's clear under the special legislation is that 
there can't be a claim of a constructive approval so long as the, the state of emergency is in effect. So that was a very long answer, but the, the short version is I'm comfortable that given, given the ongoing state of emergency, given even the 180 day time frame that exists under the regulations, the board is not facing any sort of ending deadline. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, uh, do we have any other uh, raised hands from the public? Uh, not at this time. Okay. So, do we, uh, if the board <coughs> doesn't seem to have any other pressing questions at this point. Should we talk about the next meeting and what we want to discuss specifically? Uh, Eric and Mario. Mr. Chairman, oh, Mr. excuse me. Yeah. Um, might, I, might I suggest given that um, they seem to be the uh, uh, the topics of interest, so to speak. Um, might I suggest that we do fire and traffic uh, at the next meeting and, and take on what appear to be the bigger questions uh, on the project? It sounds fine to me, Eric. Uh, how do you feel? He's muted. Hold on. That's a thumbs up. Am I good? Okay, Eric. Yes. All right. Yeah. Yes, I would. I would agree with that. And if we if we have um, might we set up the next meeting after after that, or at least um, at the next meeting, try to set an agenda if we have planning board or police or town or some other review that we try to um, address that so that there's a logical order. But I'm in agreement with fire and traffic. Uh, <clears throat> Mario? I might Go ahead, sir. I was just gonna say, I might suggest we add water to that because our fire chief can also speak to that item. Well, <clears throat> maybe we want someone representing uh, Byfield uh, water since there seems to be a difference of opinion on whether the water supply is adequate. He's on the Byfield Water District, so. The fire chief? I'm a little confused. Fire chief is part of the Byfield Water District as well. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. All right. Mario, anything to add for the next meeting? No, I, I, I concur. I think that's good fire traffic water. Okay. So the next step would be to uh, make a meeting date. So So for September, we have um, typically our normal meeting night would be the 17th for other ZBA related items. Um, so that leaves us either with the 10th or the 24th. Eric and Mario, any preference on those dates or availability? I'm good with both. I'm good with both. Okay, Mr. Deshane's uh, the availability of you and the applicant. Uh, Ms. Chairman, I am checking my schedule as we speak, but I can assure you that I will make myself available for either day. Okay. I think the 24th would be a good time, so. Okay. Um, uh, so I will just confirm that with Stantec and with um, the fire chief. 
and confirm that on the beginning of next week if everybody um, finds that acceptable. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, if I could, I did just check my schedule and I, I must apologize. I, I am scheduled to be out of the state on the 24th. If there is any date near about that time, um, I would appreciate if the board could accommodate that. I'm sorry, it's, um, I, I just checked my schedule. The 24th is a very difficult date for me. Okay. Um, sorry. So I, have, I haven't solidified the 17th. So we could swap the two Thursdays if you'd like. I, I would be, very much appreciate that. Okay, that's fine with me also. I think uh, if we're, we're available for both nights. So if we switch the uh, dates, it'll work. Okay, right. Okay. Okay, so the 17th. I apologize for that. It's okay. And uh, are you agreeable to my confirming that with the Stantec and the fire chief at uh, the beginning of next week, Mr. DeShanes? Okay. Oh, yes, of course. We'll help you with that. Okay. All right. Uh, so if there's no other business, uh, I'll ask that we uh, have a motion to uh, continue the meeting through the 17th. Looks up. Looks like Eric has a question. Okay, that's fine. Mr. Chairman, is there any new information that needs to be delivered or disseminated? Or do we do we have everything that's been issued to us? Or are there revisions or something else that's coming our way before the next meeting? Who are you asking, Eric? Uh, I'm asking the applicant. Yeah, okay. I guess, you know, Sue would have anything in her possession would have let us know what that something was coming. So is there any planned updates? I'm just I, I do know that um, Mr. Osgood is providing some updated information uh, to your peer review consultants. Um, we are expecting to receive peer review comments from your environmental uh, peer reviewer. So I suspect that will be new uh, information. Um, I am also hoping that I will have an opportunity to go through my notes tonight and potentially provide written responses to some of the questions that the abutters had. I will make sure that those are provided at least in a week in advance of the meeting. So at this point, uh, those are the kinds of things I would expect uh, that you would receive prior to that meeting. Thank you. And if I could, if I could also add, um, Go ahead, ben. we did, we did address uh, Joe Schwaka's second round of comments and we submitted electronically those plans and yesterday and we'll make the copies and get the hard copies to the board um, by Monday at the latest. Um, and if I could also add, you referenced a letter from the Parker River Watershed Association. I don't know that we've seen that. I'm not sure if you've seen it, Doug. No, I was going to call tomorrow and ask for it. Okay, and, and so maybe I'm just wondering, I know it, th this whole situation is so difficult and um, I know, Sue, you had posted things online previously. I don't know if it's just not able to be done now. Uh, you know, and you had done a very good job the, the last time we were here, posting everything when it was received, labeling it, and it was a very good resource for us to keep up to date. I don't know if that's possible now, or even just a list of what's received, so we could just kind of take a look at it and say, hey, can you send us this? Um, yeah, I, I'm fairly certain that the pie letter was sent. It is dated 2019. Um, okay. September of 2019. So I will make sure that is sent out to you again. And just confirm the list of comments that I've received from the different departments yeah. and other organizations and abutters. And, and to the other one regarding the water was Kristen Grubbs for environmental planner. Mm -hmm. She had mentioned the same yeah. thing. Clean water. 
Yeah. And to address your question, Ben, I'll do my best. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> it's very difficult these days. I understand 100%. Right. Yeah, yeah. So we'll just have to, you know, we'll, we'll work through it all as we go. That's right. Okay, so uh, do we have a motion to uh, continue the meeting to September 17th? to continue the meeting to September 17th. Second. Okay, thank you. All in favor? And Aye. we need to do this by a roll call. Uh, Mario? Yes. Eric? Yes. And I vote yes. Motion passes. So we'll continue to uh, September 17th. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of thank the board. You. Yep. Thank you. Susan, thank you.